Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our program tonight. We're so glad that you have joined us, and uh, this has been a great day already, and it's a better day because we get to come and share the Word of God with you tonight. And so we're back to online services for a few weeks here, going up toward the Thanksgiving holiday, but uh, it's good to be able to share online. It is. We're glad that we can come to you like this. While we're apart, we're still together, so we're glad that you've tuned in tonight. And I'm expecting God to speak to us tonight. I put out a minute ago, get I ready. Too. I believe God's got a word for us tonight. Amen. I agree. And so the first thing you can do to help us is hit that share tab to let people know and remind them that we are online, and uh, that'll help us out if you'll do that. And then, of course, our Sunday services are staying just as they have been. 9 o'clock a.m. is our early service and then uh, 10.30 a.m. is our second service, and we, we just had a great season. I mean, I know we are in the midst of COVID-19, and uh, it has changed a lot of things, but this has really been a great year at Grace Fellowship That's Church. That's exactly how I see it. You know, I see so many people who are down and discouraged, but I'm not. I'm encouraged. God has kept us. God has been faithful. God has been with us. And even though it's been a trying time, we are a blessed people. We're victorious. So when we come in here on Sunday, there's no, nothing to be sad about. We're here to celebrate and lift up the king. And this past Sunday is exactly what we did. We had church in this place. You know, there's a lot of turmoil in the world right now in general. Yeah. A lot of things going on all around the world and here in our nation, some division. But God is still God and he Amen. is good. And we just, this whole year, uh, I believe we've had exactly what God wanted us to have. I don't think that we missed anything spiritually, uh, and I'm speaking for this congregation. I do not believe we have missed anything that God had in store for us, and we don't have a whole lot of this year left. And so no, we don't. <laughs> I'm convinced. I imagine we've been in this season since March. Uh, it is, and but I'm convinced that for the remainder of November and December, we are going to receive exactly what the Lord has for us, and... God is already dealing with me about 2021. Praise and God. I'm real excited about 2021. I am too. It's going to be a good year. It is. Amen. And no matter what season we find ourselves in, we can always find something good in it. We really can. Praise the Lord. We're not without hope. Never without hope. Never without hope. And you're not either. Amen. If your trust is in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we're glad you've joined us tonight. And uh, let's pray. And uh, we'll get right into this lesson here tonight. Father, thank you for this great day. Thank you for your word that is sure, everlasting. And Father, we thank you that we have the blessed hope that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you to lead us tonight and direct us in this lesson. Father, we receive what you have in store for us by faith. We receive it already in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the notes are online, and you can get them uh, on YouTube and also Facebook, so find those notes and pull them. Uh, if you didn't before the session tonight, pull them afterwards and go back over them this week, and uh, that way you'll get more out of the session. Well, we are it, it's hard to believe, but we're up to session six, and uh, these are the first five sessions that we've done. Uh, the first one was an introduction to grace. Session two was saved by grace. Session three, established in righteousness. Session four, grace and rest. And then last week, we dealt with the fruit of righteousness. Now, let me say this. Uh, the first four sessions, we have dealt with our salvation and the fact that we are made righteous through what the Lord Jesus did at the cross, and by no, nothing we do other than believe for it. We have faith for it, but as far as any works to achieve it, to earn it, to accomplish it, we didn't do it. So we are saved by grace through our faith, and which simply means we are made righteous and another way of saying that is we are made right with God. I am right with God because of what Jesus did and my faith in what he did. That's simply it. And so we covered that strongly in the first four sessions. Now, 
Last week, we transitioned because uh, when you start teaching grace, people start thinking, well, what about sin? Uh, does sin even hold any place at all in this grace teaching? Does, is there any significance even with sin? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, sin always has consequences either for the unbeliever, the unsaved, or the saved. There's consequences. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is the consequences of sin. Amen. And so we believe that there are consequences. Amen. And, <laughs> Amen. And different consequences, heavier consequences regarding the sin that you actually are involved in. Right. And we'll, we'll get into this tonight. Uh, last week, our title was The Fruit of Righteousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave you uh, this classic, wonderful, strong word from the Apostle Paul, Romans 6. Uh, and actually, I just put verse 1 and 2 in these notes because Paul had been teaching grace so strongly that the people were saying, well, if grace is this great, why don't we just go on sinning? And actually, there was a crew of them that were actually saying, if grace is so great and God gets such glory out of extending grace to us, well, let's sin so he can extend more grace and that way, he'll get more glory. So in Romans 6, verse 1 and 2, uh, this is the New Living Translation, I believe, uh, Paul said, well, then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Now, notice what he said here. Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? And the King James Version, the traditional King James said, God forbid. Absolutely not. Right. We can't just keep on sinning. That is not what this grace is all about. So as far as the sinning, the sinning question, after we're saved, do we just go on and sin and there and no consequences and no concern for it? Absolutely not. We need to take note that grace wants to deliver us from the lifestyle of sin and grace wants to empower Power. us to be free of those sinful acts. Amen. Amen. You want to add to that? <laughs> no, it's exactly what grace does empower us. That's a, that's a positive thing, a great thing. It empowers us to live the life It empowers us. Right. All right. Now, while grace freely provided the escape from the sinner status, see, I was a sinner. I'm not now. <laughs> Even if I sin now, I'm not a sinner because sinner status was uh, passed on from Adam. We were born into sin, right. okay? So while grace freely provided the escape from the sinner status, we should not assume that we may freely continue to give ourselves to acts of sin. And so that's what we talked about last week because righteousness should have a harvest. It should have fruit, all right? So if you are made righteous and now you are in right standing with God, there ought to be some fruit. Now, with that being said, do Christians ever miss the mark? All the time. All the time. And uh, I asked the question, I think, last week, is there anybody here that hasn't sinned since you got saved? Now, I want to tell you, if somebody raises their hand and says, I have not committed a sin since I was born again, unless you just barely are in the kingdom, you got born again right at this second, then... Either you are being a playing the hypocrite or you don't understand or you're deceived by self-righteousness because Paul and others, the apostles, spoke to what about sin in the lives of believers. Now, we know about sin in the lives of unbelievers, but believers miss the mark too, all right? And so that's what we're dealing with now in this part of our series on grace. And tonight we're dealing with sin's consequences. So just as righteousness has a harvest, what well, we talked about last week, if I'm righteous, I will have a harvest of that righteousness, the fruits of righteousness. We had that scripture last week. Sin also brings a harvest. Okay. Right? So if righteousness brings a harvest, sin brings a harvest. If the deeds of righteousness or right living produces a harvest, then sinful acts or sinful living or simply 
doing what God uh, doesn't desire or doing what's absolutely against the word of God, sin, also brings a harvest. Well, uh, it's reaping. It's reaping. What we are sowing for. Yes, and uh, we'll look at the scripture in a few minutes. It tells us, you know, you know the scripture, God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth. That shall he also, that shall he also reap. Now, so while acts of sin, make sure you get this, may not change our righteous position in Christ, Sinning will have consequences. Now, we've discussed this at great length, and so I just want to barely hit it again tonight for the sake of some that may not have been listening. And if you have not watched the previous sessions, you've got to go back because what happens is people a lot of times in a teaching like this will grab a session here and there, and then they'll say, well, the pastor said this or he taught this, but they didn't hear what the pastor taught two weeks ago. Right. All right? So in this kind of teaching, before you judge anything that is said, go back and listen to all the sessions previously and you can get a full picture of what we have taught on this subject. But an act of sin doesn't change my righteous standing with God. If it did, then I'd be saved one day, lost the next, saved when I'm having a good day and everything's going well. But if for some reason I miss the mark, whatever it would be, then I would be unrighteous and unsaved again. And there are people who live their lives like that. We've discussed that in great length. Yeah. But that is not what the Word of God teaches. I am made righteous in Jesus, and uh, my acts of uh, righteousness didn't cause me to be made righteous, and my acts of sin do not remove me out of that righteous standing. Yet there are consequences to that sin. And that's what we want to come to an understanding on. So I put in the notes, if you do get these, that they're uh, a, a personal commentary, some things personally I wanted to make sure people understood uh, about this subject. First of all, a person who has been born again should have a desire to grow in the fruit of righteousness. If you do not have a desire to grow in righteous living, there's a problem. Uh, and, you know, I, I look at it like this. If a person... Uh, that has been born again or says they're born again and the same sinful tendencies are always at work there that they had prior to salvation and they have no desire to change those acts whatsoever, then I think we have to question the validity or the authenticity of their salvation experience. Does that make sense? Uh, because you should have a desire for change. A desire and an uncomfortableness. Yes. With sinning now. What used to come in a comfortable way now doesn't because you pass from death into life and the old man has become new. Old things pass away, all things become new. So if you're still living like that, it should be very uncomfortable for you. It should be uncomfortable. You should not get the same level of joy out of that same act of sin that you got prior to being born again because your spirit is different. And if, if there's no difference in it, uh, then you need to question the, the, the born-again experience, you know, because truly, if you can go on living exactly the same with no change, no desire to change whatsoever, and uh, still a love for those things of the world, then there, there's a spiritual issue somewhere. Now, my pastor many years ago I've told this before, but I don't know if, if these watching tonight have heard it, but I had a pastor who had a real addiction to alcohol and being a drunk, really, and uh, alcoholic status. And so after he got saved, he stopped in the same bar with the same buddies from work and went to get the glass of alcohol and sat down and, and had the drink and he had an experience that was kind of unique. He said, when I picked that glass up and turned it up and I looked, and right in the bottom of that glass, I could see a perfect cross. And I've heard him testify many times. He said, I set that glass down and I walked out and I never picked it up again. Now, I realize others may have more of a struggle than that. 
But what he was saying is he could not go in and enjoy it as he did before. There was a difference, and there should be a difference, all right? Uh, a person who has truly been born again should have a sense of hatred towards sin. I heard today that the reason so many people struggle with sin is because many of them still have a love for their sin. They enjoy it. You know, none of us would sin if there wasn't some joy in it. The Bible says there's, there's pleasure in sin for a season. season. There is a pleasure for a season. But then the Bible says that sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. So there, that's part of the consequences of sin. If you stay in sin, it will produce death in your life. But they said that the only way to really overcome sin in this, the thing I was watching today was um, when you love Jesus more than you love your sin. And the more you love him, the more you want to be like him. And the more you love him, the more you grow in him, and you become um, more like him as you are maturing. So, of course, when we start off, we're babes in Christ, you know. Right. But we should be maturing and growing, and our love for the Lord should be growing as well. One of the things, if you take note through the epistles, uh, you know, from Romans over through all the writings to the church, Many of those letters were to churches about carnality. In fact, there were places the Apostle Paul said, you are carnal. And he said, because you're carnal, you can't receive the word of God. I have to deal with you as babies. And uh, carnal means they were still fleshy. And if you really take note, if you really want to do a study, you look at some of the things believers were dealing with. I mean, we're, we're talking about not questionable is this sin. We're talking about out-and-out out big sin lists that some of these churches were dealing with. And uh, the Apostle Paul still referred to the vast majority of these peoples as, as brethren, yeah. all right? But he never put an approval on that sin. Now, I need to say something right here. Uh in the weeks ahead, and maybe by next week, we're going to begin dealing with the process for breaking free of those things, all right? Because God wants you to be free. And so don't give up and fall into condemnation because of sin and the consequences of sin. Stay with this thing in faith trusting in the Lord Jesus and in what he has done to make you righteous, and that's part of the process that we'll get into in the weeks to come. Right. All right. Now, uh, born-again people still deal with temptation and the ability to sin. We've already talked about that. Born-again people uh, do end up uh, in sin, and the same grace that provided salvation, the, the salvation experience also provides help and a remedy for us believers, when we sin, the good news is we're not without remedy. We've got a remedy for sin even after we are saved. And God knew so much of this, he put scriptures in there like, you know, uh, don't sin, but if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, who is righteous. And if you do sin, uh, the Bible said that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. These are all scriptures to believers. To believers, that's exactly right. To believers. All right, so back to our text or our, our lesson tonight. What are the consequences of sin? Well, we're going to look at some different verses tonight. Uh, for, let's start with 1 John 3, verse 20 through 23. Do you have that one there? Read that for us. Okay. This is New King James. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. All right. Now notice here. The first statement in verse 20, he says, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now, and then he goes on and says, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. So he's talking about condemnation in the heart. Now, notice what he did not say. He did not say that if there is condemnation, you have lost your righteous 
status. <laughs> He's talking about believers who are dealing with condemnation because of sin that they have not dealt with. And the first thing that you can be assured of that's going to happen when you sin as a believer, there will be a level of condemnation. All right? Now, the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ, you know, who... Uh, There's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Who, them who are in Christ. Who walk not after flesh. Walk not flesh, but after the Spirit. So spiritually, there is no condemnation. But in my mind, I can quickly be condemned if I have done something that I know is wrong. Now, God won't condemn me, but... The Holy Spirit will convict me and show me where I need to make a change, where I need to course correct, where I need to apologize to somebody or if I need to correct something I did or said. He will show me that in a constructive way. He does not condemn us. But I can assure you, and you, I don't even have to testify to this. You know this to be true. Just as soon as you do something that is not right, According to this word, you will feel a sense of condemnation in your heart. There's a better scripture, a better word. The Bible says godly sorrow works repentance. And you feel sorrow for what you've done. You, you know, it, it makes you feel bad that you know you've, you've done something that you shouldn't have, something that was against God. And there's that sorrow. There is that conviction. I don't like the word condemnation because the Bible says there is no condemnation. Any condemnation is not from God, of course. It's from us and from our inner voice or from the enemy. Right. But you have to notice that he said if our heart condemns us. That's true. You know, it would be good when you talked about that a minute ago. It would be good maybe next class if we had a um, had the, the Greek meaning for condemnation and conviction and compare those two. But you're exactly right. Here it does say if our heart does condemn us. If it condemns us, then here's the consequences. Uh, well, it's revealed in verse 21, if your heart doesn't condemn you, you have confidence toward God. So what we can say to that is, when your heart condemns you, you lose confidence toward God. Right. And the other thing you can say is, there's no condemnation from God. It's right. your own it's heart. It's your heart. Your own mind. But it will happen. Yeah. And it's inevitable that if you do not deal with that sin, the first consequence will be your heart will condemn you. And, and the other thing is the devil will get right on the bandwagon with it and will encourage the condemnation by pointing out other things that you've done wrong. All right, so we need to make sure that our heart does not condemn us, and the only way to deal with that is to deal with the sin that brought that level of condemnation. And so to deal with it is to confess it and make sure uh, that we deal with it scripturally and uh, be willing to confess that and allow him to cleanse us of that, that unrighteous deed, act, not unrighteousness in the sense of our position. That didn't change. But as far as righteous acts, unrighteous acts, those can change. Now, we said this because of condemnation, confidence is hindered. Well, confidence is very important. Number one, it's important when exercising spiritual authority. If I do not have my spiritual confidence built up, then the devil shows up. I will struggle to exercise authority and put him in his place because he will tell me I don't have the right to and he will point out my flaws and all this stuff, you know. And so if he can find a place to point out that condemnation and elevate that condemnation, you'll walk away and refuse to use your authority thinking you deserve whatever's coming upon you. All right? The second thing is, and it goes right with this, Confidence is hindered in prayer. In fact, uh, if you read uh, uh, in that scripture, let me go back. In prayer is what your note says. I want to go back on that a minute. It says, verse 22, well, let's read verse 21. It says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God, and whatever we ask, we receive. All right. Uh, because if we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So if condemnation is there, it means we've done something that's not pleasing in his sight. 
And it says here, whatsoever we ask, we receive because we have that confidence. So if that confidence is lost, our prayer is hindered. It even approaches the way, it even affects the way you approach the Lord. The Bible says, come boldly before the throne. So when you don't have confidence, you don't come boldly. It most likely, if you have sinned, you're going to spend all your prayer time uh, repenting, repenting. <laughs> and begging God, yep. you know, to forgive and, you. And not just that, tell them how unworthy you are, and right. how sorry you are, just, you know. And, and, you know, a lot of prayers are filled with apologies, but God never asks for an apology anywhere. No. All right. So he does want repentance. Which is course correction, changing yes. direction. And the Holy Spirit works to enable us through grace to repent and to bring that course correction. But if we do not, one of the things we are going to deal with is this condemnation which hinders our confidence and you're not going to be able to stand strong against the demonic forces that are coming and you are going to struggle in your prayer life. All right? Let's go on to Galatians uh, 6, 7 through 9. We mentioned this one earlier, but read that one. Very familiar passage. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to his spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Now Paul to the Galatians is talking about the harvest of sin. All right. And he says, he really refers to the spiritual law that is at work in the earth, and that is uh, seed time and harvest, and whatever you sow, you reap, okay? We talk a lot about sowing the Word of God in your heart in this church and the necessity of sowing to your spirit. But if you sow to the flesh, this passage says you will reap corruption. And corruption... Uh, two words, I, I, the definition I found was destruction and perishing is really what biblical corruption is. So where sowing to your spirit brings an everlasting flow of life, and, and we could say it like this, everything in life, everything in light that God is comes through sowing to the spirit. But when you sow to the flesh, uh, through sin, then you reap what is associated with darkness, death, and sin, and that is corruption, which means perishing, things will perish in your life, and destruction. You know, the Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. So when you are sowing to do acts of what he tells you to do through temptation, then you get the harvest of corruption or destruction which is associated with him. Now, I made just a simple list here on the bottom of page three. Uh, spiritual corruption. Your spirit will not fare well when you're living in sin. It just won't. Your spirit will not be what it needs to be. It will not be in tune with God. It will not be sensitive to the things of God like it should be because sin will hinder it, all right? Also, physical corruption. I think uh, there are diseases that are connected to activity of sin. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but it's evident that there are certain diseases especially that are connected to sin. And lifestyles. And lifestyles. Yes. Right. Mental corruption. How, how many uh, people are under a load of stress and it goes back to acts of sin? Now, we're not saying that all stress is because of sin. Please don't under, misunderstand that. But I can assure you this. If you're living in direct contradiction to God's way of doing things, there's a certain level of stress with that. And... Uh, Mental stress that will affect not just your mind, but your emotions uh, and also your body, even your health, okay? Uh, how many marriages have faced corruption or destruction because of 
sowing to the flesh. Uh, children, your children can be impacted. Family is impacted by sowing to the flesh, sinful activity. Uh, how many finances have been affected? People have lost their job because of something they did or they have spent their finances. I or know squandered people it. squandered their wealth on gambling and yeah. uh, many different things. We had a man that came and spoke many years ago at Grace Fellowship and he had a major addiction to porn and to prostitutes in, uh, even in uh, Nevada, in uh, uh, Las, Vegas. Las Vegas. And uh, he had spent a fortune on these things. And would that be corruption? Well, sure it would. And would it be so into the flesh? And yes, it's, so, yes. it's certainly not so into the spirit. So although this, this is a man who had believed in Christ, confessed Christ, and now is pastoring a church and delivered, praise God. But now he would tell you this. This occurred in his life after salvation. And he would tell you, it wasn't that I wasn't saved. He, it was a bondage, a stronghold that could not be broken. But once he saw that broken off of his life, the activity changed. And so he had a great uh, harvest of corruption, although he claimed to be born again. Mm. All right. Uh, go, uh, this is, uh, let me make sure I'm in the right place here, but a couple of things in regard to Jesus. Uh, notice this verse, John 5, 14. Read that one for us. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Now, let me say something right here. Jesus had grace demonstrated always for sin or for the sinner, always. And let's, let's go a step further with that. Even his own disciples, Peter included, especially Peter, who sinned greatly on the night Jesus was arrested and, uh, and renounced his faith, basically said, I don't know him, I'm not one of them. It don't get much worse than that. And he didn't just do it one time, he did it three times, all right, Before, in one night. Jesus never came and condemned Peter, and Peter did repent, and Peter was brought back on course, but Jesus was full of grace toward Peter and, and, and his disciples. So Jesus always demonstrated grace, but there was one thing Jesus never did, he never told people, go on living your lifestyle of sin. Never did he ever do that. In fact, this one verse right here, um, he told this man whom he healed, you go and sin no more, sin no more. lest the worst thing come upon you. Now I want to point something out on that passage. Notice it starts out, verse 14 says, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. Now Jesus didn't heal him in the temple. Jesus healed him somewhere else. You can read the story if you go back in John 5. But for whatever reason, Jesus decided, I think because he, he knew he needed to, he went and found the man later and uh, had a message for him. And the message was, uh, see, since you have been made well, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. It's like Jesus saw the need to go and tell this man, listen, you need to make sure you don't go back to the same lifestyle you were in before or something worse is going to be coming upon you as a consequence because your sin is going to open a door for this physical infirmity to come back and maybe something even worse. I think that's what he was saying. All right, so the fourth thing that we need to understand from what Jesus told this man is that the consequence of sin can be an open door for the enemy even in the life of a believer. Sin has consequences. So even when a believer sins, there's grace to, to deal with that sin. Right. But that sin can have consequences, uh, great consequences, especially if it's not dealt with. All right. Then 
Uh, let's look at John 8, verse 10 and 11. This is the woman caught in the act of adultery. You want to read that one for us there? Sure. John 8, 10 through 11. When Jesus raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now notice here he says, I don't condemn you. But now what we read earlier said, If your heart condemns you. So God's not the condemner. Jesus didn't condemn Sin still has a condemning effect within us. That's a good way of putting it. That clears up what I was within saying. Within us. Early. Good. That's, I like that. And, and I'll, we may get into this in the next couple of weeks. Some of those passages that are in the epistles about how to deal with sin, it wasn't to deal with sin before the Father. It was to deal with sin within us. Because on earth, there are consequences for sin uh, in this life that we will deal with. And so many of those references, I think, that we are given about confessing sin and such, it's, it's for the benefit of what's happening within us. Ever bit as much, maybe even more so, than before the Father. Because before the Father, he's seeing us in Jesus at all times, all right? Now, something else I'll just throw in right here. Everything we're talking about, last week we talked about the necessity of renewing the mind, and you hit that again Sunday. We hit the necessity of putting on the new man and putting off the old man. Now, let me ask you a question. Where is it or when is it that we need the new man put on and the old man put off and the renewing of the mind? When is it that we need that? Where is it that we need that? Here. Now, from the time you get saved until the time you cross over, because when you get there, I don't think, now I know we're going to ever be learning things, but I don't think I'm going to have to renew my mind. To, that sin's not going to be an issue when I get up there. My flesh and my body won't be an issue because I'm going to have a new body. Amen. So the putting on of the new man and putting off of the old and the renewing of the mind, all these things that deal with, with sin and the activity of the flesh are for here because from the time you get saved till the time you depart, you're in a war zone and the battle is fierce going on against us to bring us into sinful activity. All right, does that make sense? Yes. Now, go back to this uh, woman here, John 8, uh, 10 through 11. says, when Jesus uh, had raised himself up and saw no one, he said, woman, where are thy accusers? The accusers of yours has no one condemned you. And uh, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Sometimes in grace teaching, people want to look at the great grace that Jesus demonstrated, but they want to leave off that little instruction there where he said to her, go and sin no more. And it's interesting because he didn't condemn her, but yet he's telling her, you need to get out of sin. You need to get out of the sinful lifestyle. Why would he tell her that? Because sin has consequences. And although he did not judge her according to the law, because if he had of, he would have had to have her stoned that day. He didn't judge her according to the law. He judged her demonstrating grace, which said no condemnation. But although there's no condemnation for that sin, don't continue in it, because that sin will have consequences. And the consequences is what brought her to him that day. Right. They, they, there was consequences. They had called her, and they were ready to... Punish her, kill her. So, yes. So, he's telling her, this is not the life you want to, to live, and it's not the best for you. You know something to be said there? Whenever God says yes, it's for our good, and whenever God says no, it's for our good. Always, whatever God tells us to do, 
It is always for his good, for our good, and for the abundant life to flow in our lives. So she could not live the abundant life that God had for her, the best life that God had for her, if she was going to continue living the life of an adulteress. So he said, go, sin no more, because there will be consequences. All right. Now, uh, so an open door, sin is an open door for the enemy, but also sin is like a thief, and it robs us. And so the devil is a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So sin comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It will steal your joy, your peace, your Christian zeal. I can tell you right now, I have never witnessed a Christian who is involved in sin full of joy. They're just not. Most times they're miserable, <laughs> very miserable, because they know that this is not the life that God has for them, and, and they're, they're feeling that load, that weight of guilt that they're not supposed to be feeling. And so sin will rob you of your joy. It will rob you of your peace and your Christian zeal. All right. Now, i got a couple of verses I just wanted to throw in here uh, that are not in the notes uh, that I thought went really well with this. And I think I did give them to you. But 1 Corinthians 10, 23, this is the Amplified Classic. It says, all things are legitimate, permissible, and we are free to do anything we please. Wow. <laughs> but not all things are helpful, expedient, profitable, and wholesome. All things are legitimate, but not all things are constructive to character and edifying to spiritual life. Isn't that good? Now, that's interesting because that's a verse we don't, in many cases, we don't preach that verse a whole lot unless you're preaching real grace. <laughs> they didn't preach that one in my church. They didn't preach that in your church. No, they didn't preach that one. And, and honestly, a lot of churches that are based on a grace foundation didn't even know quite what to do with that because it's such a strong statement. Let's read it in two other versions. The uh, God's Word translation some may say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is helpful. I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything encourages growth. Uh, the easy-to-read version, all things are allowed, you say, but not all things are good. All things are allowed, but some things don't help anyone. So with grace, these people were getting a revelation that I'm no longer subject to condemnation before God because grace and righteousness is my free gift. And I'm no longer bound by keeping rules, regulations, and laws. For the law. Mm -hmm. Yes. But Paul wanted to make sure they understood. You might be able to say grace covers this. But even if grace would cover it, not all things are beneficial. In fact, what he's actually saying is some things are downright harmful that you might try to cover in grace. So uh, he's basically saying you can't use grace. You, you need some wisdom here to understand that if you're doing things and saying, well, grace is covering this, I can do this, I can do this, you need to consider, are there some consequences going to happen because of this? Well, you know, the Bible says lust when it's conceived. That's the next verse. <laughs> oh, that's not my notes. Oh, it's on the back of the page. Well, let's go ahead and read that one then. Yeah, this is, uh, skip, look, the King James is midways there. It says, uh, this is James 1.15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And when, is a, when, uh, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Back up in the ESV version, it says, Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, fully brings grown. forth death. I like that translation. When it's fully, fully grown. Fully grown. Comes to a maturity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that verse basically is saying the exact same thing that Galatians said that whatsoever a man soweth, that will he also reap. And if he sows to the spirit, life, or the flesh, corruption. Well, corruption here is associated with death, 
And so once sin, lust has conceived and brings forth sin, and sin, once it is to the full-grown status, the harvest is death. Now, that could be death. Could be physical. Could be absolutely physical death. How many people have lost their life early because they were where they should not have been? I know I know some. Doing what they should not have been doing. Now, if you do a prison ministry, and I have been in some of these prisons, and there's always one story that you'll hear over and over, and that is, I should not have been with who I was with, and I should not have been where I was at. That, that was wrong the issue. Place, wrong, wrong place. Wrong time. Wrong, wrong people. Time. Exactly. And so, uh, but there are those who have died early deaths. Gone because of sin. Now, it's not just physical death. Uh, a lot of times when we read that word death in Scripture, we, we, we want to think about the heart stopping and just the death of the body. That's what we tend to think of. That is not what death is. It is, but it isn't completely that. It's more than that, all right? It is also anything associated with the spirit of death which comes through the fall. So it can be sickness, disease, poverty, uh, addiction, anything that is on the side of death and darkness would be in this realm. So sin, the harvest of sin, when it is complete and mature, will always bring forth something in the death realm, the realm of death, all right? And nobody wants that harvest, <laughs> or at least if they, if they know about it, they do not want it. And so that's in the consequences of sin. So even as believers who are born again, who have been forgiven sin, the sin issue is dealt with, we have been declared righteous, there's a remedy for every sin, past, present, and future in Christ Jesus. You do not want to continue in sin. The desire should always be to get out of that sinful act, that sinning, that, that activity. Mm -hmm. And that's God's best. And the good news is the same grace that forgives us and cleanses us is what empowers us to walk free of that sinful act or sinful activity, all right? And that's what we're going to be dealing with in the weeks to come. So we're going to talk about in the weeks to come, if you are struggling, yes. the steps to freedom. Let me run something by you and um, see what you think about it. I heard a minister preaching on this um, not too long ago, and he was talking about someone in his church that was dealing with drug addiction. Actually, it was weed. They were addicted to smoking weed. And they were Christian, and they were struggling with this, and they were not happy with where they were. They kept, you know, just falling into this and doing it, and they felt like it was wrong. They shouldn't be. And um, they began to say, the grace of God empowers me to be free from this. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Even when they would smoke weed, they would say that. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The grace of God empowers me. And he said that over a course of time, that began to, to like set them free to where they could not say those words. It was like an awakening. I am empowered to overcome this. I am the righteousness of God, and this is not a righteous thing that I'm doing. Therefore, I shouldn't be doing it. And the person was totally delivered, but it was a process. It was not an instant deliverance. It was a process. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, we discussed, I think, last week or week before last, there are those people who have instantaneous deliverances. I don't doubt that, okay? However, even if you have an instantaneous deliverance, there are still things that need to be worked on in us. And uh, I have come to the conclusion from the Word of God, He's going to be working on me until I leave this body. This body's a problem. <laughs> and, and you might as well face it, it is a problem. And uh, at its best, I know uh, we believe in sanctification, and uh, you can discipline this body, but Paul made it clear, i got to deal with it daily. As long as you're in this body, there's an issue until you leave it. Thank God one day we will lay it aside 
and we're going to have a brand new body. Amen. Praise the Lord. But yes, I believe we've done a bad job in helping people with the process of deliverance. And in many cases, we would have people get converted, and the moment they would fall, they were right back out again, and nobody was there to pick them up and help them and see that, that God will help you through those seasons. Now, what you said about that person was they kept that confession. Well, you know, the Bible tells us, hold fast to our profession of faith. Well, Without our profession wavering. of faith is not based on what I do. It's based on what he did. All right? So my profession of faith will not change. My faith is in him. So I like that. But uh, they, were, they were holding fast to their identity in Christ, although their identity in this world or in the flesh was in contrast. Well, the Bible says that the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and the two are contrary one to another. And really, I can't get into this tonight, you are, I am, we are, spirit, soul, and body. And the spirit is born again. And Colossians says, I am complete in him, in my spirit. Hallelujah. Well, my body is where the acts come in. Deeds, things are done. I don't do anything outside of my body. If I talk, it's out of my body. If I use my hands, it's my body. If I, a thief uses their body to steal, an adulterer, got to use their body. So the, the soul realm is between the two. And that is where the mind, will, and emotions are. That's why Paul said you must renew that middle area, which is the mind. Because although I'm born again and complete in him, my body will try to go on doing what it has done prior to salvation. And my mind and, and my natural mind is still in that same pattern of old ways of thinking and mindsets. That's why we need to put on the new man, put off the old man, do it by the renewing of the mind. That's the process this person was doing. And what they were actually doing, they were declaring who they are in Christ above what their body was saying about them. Above their actions. Above their actions. And what they were doing, they were exercising their authority in their true spiritual identity versus their identity of the old, the old man. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to get into this, and we're going to be dealing with this thing of walking out of that sin activity, and I believe God will help you and he'll deliver you. Amen. I believe he already has. We just got to walk in it. Praise the Lord. It's you got putting, anything he says, else? It's not putting our faith in what we do, but putting our faith in what he's done. That's it's right. Not, it's that we don't put our faith in our acts, but in what he has already done. And the first step is understanding my identity is not in me. It is settled in Jesus. I am in heavenly places in him. Seated with I him. am with the Father in him, he, God does not ever, ever see me outside of my identity in the Son. Wow, that's glorious. And so once we can get there with that and get that established, we can start to walk free. The problem is the vast majority of people in the church realm have never settled that issue. They really have never settled that issue. And so first wrong act, next thing you know, I might as well quit. Might as well give up. I'm back to lost status. I'm back to unsaved, unrighteous. And that's where the problem is. Amen. All right. We're glad you joined us tonight. Pl plan to be with us for next week's session. And join us Sunday. We're going to have a good time. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday.